How's it going everyone? It's Jeff Chrysler here, a detail enthusiast and owner of Rightway Heritage Trimming. And I'm here with another BN1 rest restoration video. Um, restoration's been done for a long time now, yes, um, but uh, I'm proud to say I am on the organizing committee for uh, the West Coast Rendezvous meet, uh, which is happening in May 2024. It's uh, May 19th to the 23rd. So um, it's the biggest kind of West Coast Austin Healy meet that happens every year. So expecting lots of people, big turnout. And of course, it's, it's a large enough meet that we are going to be hosting a sanctioned concourse judging for anyone who wants to sign up. So here is my golden opportunity to finally get BN1 judged for concourse. So it's, it's winter now, so we're going to be putting it up on axle stands, taking the wheels off and doing a whole bunch of things over the winter, uh, just mostly little detail improvements. And um, so I've been pretty uh, proactive last few weeks on the phone and hunting down detail parts and trying to get stuff sorted out. Um, and uh, I'll take you through what's gonna be happening. But basically, I, I, to start off, I printed out a set of uh, up-to-date concourse score sheets and Kind of went through my car the other day uh, from front to back and judged it as I would if I was judging any other car and uh, tried to be as critical as possible because you never know who your judges are and how lenient or strict they may be. Um, so I'm trying to be, you know, worst case scenario, I might lose point for this and that, you know. And um, so yeah, I've got, I've got my score sheets. I know where I may or may not lose points. So I'm gonna target those areas and really try to polish it up and get it as good as I can for Concours. So I'll take you through it and show you what we're gonna be doing this year. Now, just a few notes on Concours. Um, Concours for Austin Healy's is its own, uh, we have our own set of standards, set of guidelines, um, and, and way of judging. Um, sort of similar to JAG's, it was based on the JAG uh, way of scoring, um, where you have points out of 100, um, ours is actually out of 1,000, and then we divide it by 10 at the end to make it out of 100, but um, yeah, so you've got, you know, thousand points would be a you know a top-notch gold level car and basically where you wherever you fall on the points you know 950 above is a gold car so or uh, 900 to 950 is a silver car and 850 to 900 is a bronze car so your car is going to fall somewhere on that scale it's it's not in competition with the next car it's just where does it fall on the scale or is it if it's below bronze and it's not a concourse car basically. So, um, you know, our committee, it's these guidelines that we have been developing since the 80s, um, you know, which is now a, a nice thick book, I'll, I'll show you that next, um, is essential uh, source of information for uh, the originality of these cars and every part of these cars. So, you know, our mission is to provide owners with this information so that they can restore their cars to original standards and and be able to reference you know what parts should they have for for their model and year of car um, because these things evolved through production obviously and uh, it's this wonderful resource that owners can use to aid them in their restoration now we do allow things um, like accessories that were period BMC dealer accessories. So, for example, you've noticed I this year I, I decided to add some spot lamps. I've always liked the look of them. There you can see them on one of the, that's the 1953 Le Mans car, and they had those spot lamps as well. So I've always liked the look of them. They are a period accessory that you could order from, straight from BMC when you ordered the car. So we've, we allow things like that that are standard BMC accessories. Um, but that's kind of where, where it ends, you know, things that are not uh, period or, you know, uh, it has to fall within that realm and, and be something that was available at the time through, through your dealer. And so um, quite accessible for, for you to make your car, you know, original, but have whatever bells and whistles you want to add, you know. Um, so yeah it is designed for owners to restore their cars to original specs and we do 
uh, fully support and endorse and promote uh, driving your car. Um, we don't want concourse cars to be uh, labeled as trailer queens or anything like that. They're meant to be used, they're meant to be driven, and we have, you know, incentive like that built right into the guidelines. So, uh, you know, I, I, I often hear from owners, oh, I don't want to restore to concourse level, I just want a good driver. And, uh, well, what they miss is that concourse cars are of the best drivers out there. Um, they're for having it tuned properly and, and, you know, running as it should. And you also get points for every hundred miles you've driven up to, up to five points. So, you know, for things like tires where you, you would have a standard, you know, five point deduction for have not having the five original Dunlop, uh, bias ply tires, which, yeah, that's what all these big Heelys were delivered with, but they're not great for driving and for people who want to drive their car and use it, uh, you know, it's better to get a decent, you know, period spec size uh, radial, which is what I have here. I've got the, the Michelin X tires. So, but because I've driven, you know, 500 miles in the last year, I will get those five points back that I would have lost for not having the Dunlop bias plies. So things like this are, are put into our guidelines for a reason, because we want owners to enjoy and use these cars um, and keep them on the road. So now I'm gonna get into the guidelines and show you a little bit of that, which is an incredible resource. I highly recommend any Healy owner or restorer have a current set of the guidelines. It's updated every year as we're uncovering new details and verifying them and you know so our committee members uh you know we discuss all of these details every year and uh, approve them for a addition to the guidelines so it's it's an evolving uh resource source of original uh detailed information on these cars and all the com parts and components that go into them now what i have here um, is a very old set of Austin Healy Concours guidelines. So this, as you can see, is quite a thick book, a lot of information in here. Um, this one's, you know, from 2012, so it's pretty ancient as these are updated every year. So uh, new editions are somewhat thicker, actually, if, if you get a printed form. Um, but yeah, it starts off with the mission statement. You know, it's a, it's a guide for owners who want to restore their cars um, original, as correct as original, and uh, and it allows us to keep a, a record of cars that did get store, restored original, so we know which ones are out there that have been restored to such a high level of originality. And it goes, you know, through all of the procedures and judging inspection procedures and how to arrange it, the concourse judging at shows and, uh, you know, our, our views on accessories and uh, standard deductions for certain things and and then you get into the actual guidelines themselves which is where all the information is so I want to show you here fasteners it gets into all the different types of fasteners and the coating of them and the sizing of them all the British types of fasteners you can hear this diff see the different screw heads um, those impressions not to be mistaken with what posi drive was posi drive didn't come till later uh, like later six cylinder cars, but a hundred, for example, would not have any posi drive on it because it, those didn't exist yet. So all these kind of things that help your restoration to be accurate, you know, you get into original paint schemes and trim combinations that were available for all models and wonderful archive of original pieces and how these pieces evolved. Here's the, you know, the textured hoses and wiring harnesses, how they had four threads long in their original tracers, whereas most reproduction wiring harnesses you get today are only three tracers long. There's one company, uh, Rhode Island Wiring, um, that does the proper four tracer thing. However, you do pay for it because it's much more expensive than anybody else. Uh, you know, radiator stuff, original spec, and fuel pumps, and shocks, and there you can see the earliest uh, shocks there. That's on uh, the first production car. Um, yeah, great resource, just a fantastic resource. And like I say, this 
These guidelines are updated every year with new information as we're uncovering new details and facts and getting this stuff nailed down and, you know, every one of these details is, is reviewed and, you know, everybody has to approve it before it's entered. So it's, um, yeah, it's a really fantastic resource for restorers who want original uh, information and uh, there's no other book quite like it and uh, I, I highly recommend it to anybody restoring on Austin Healy. These guidelines are a wonderful resource. I should add that within these guidelines there's also uh, a, an area of supplements um, which I think we have like 12 or 14 supplements now um, which are separate detailed articles just dealing with one thing. So this is the Austin Healy uh, Tops supplement, and it just deals with the different styles of tops and top latches and top frames as they evolve through production. So you can see all the different ones as they're going along. Uh, there's a cross section of a proper top seal. That's what it should look like on the head header bar. So there's all these different supplements for different things uh, throughout the car. So these are updated as well with the, with the guidelines. And uh, like I say, there are more in-depth, detailed articles about that specific thing. So Now, the guidelines nowadays, you can't uh, just order it printed like I was showing you before. But uh, when you order it now, you can get a PDF copy or it comes on a flash drive. Or there's a number of ways to get it digitally. Uh, you can see how the newer versions, this is 2023, are much better because we've got the photos worked into whatever we're talking about. So here's air ducts. That's the early style of air duct that I've tried to redo. In fact, I provided that photo. Um, but um, yeah, there's the heater air ducts and their clamps, how those were done. You know, and you can just go through part by part, windshield washer bottles uh, as they evolved. You know, so all of this stuff is nicely illustrated and described in detail, you know, for every model. They're starting with 100, 106, 3000, and how these things have evolved. Yeah, so well worth it. There's your original radiator cap. Really hard to find those nowadays with that rivet. Um, but yeah, essential piece of information for any Healy owner or restorer. You can go through the entire car part by part and everything is in here. And um, so, yeah, you can just go to the Austin Healy uh, Concours Registry website. Just Google Austin Healy Concours Registry. It'll take you right there. Um, and you can order your guidelines there. There's, uh, you can actually sign up for a subscription uh, so that you get our yearly updates with the guidelines. Uh, I think it's up to three years or something now. Uh, you can get a sign up for a subscription. So yeah, great resource. Recommend it to any Healy owner. It's, uh, it's fantastic stuff to have. And like I say, I've got, uh, I've got a digital copy like this that I keep on my phone. Uh, so it's always at my fingertips. Anything I want to look up, I can just quickly pull up my phone and go find a picture find out what the Concours guidelines say, and there you go. You know, and it gets so detailed. You know, here's the different flasher units. That's mine right there. Here's a later style that says do not drop on them and how they evolved, and then they started getting stamped pressings without the ink. You know, neat stuff. So now I'll take you through the score sheets and see how that all relates to the guidelines. So here you can see what I've done. I've printed out a full set of the Austin Healy Concours uh, inspection forms for uh, BN1, BN2. You know, there's different sets of forms for the different series of big Healy's. Um, and so this is the front page. There's 20 pages in total. Uh, so you fill out all your information here. Um, this page will be mostly filled out by the chief judge at the end. So here you can see all the different categories that are within these uh, inspection forms and you do all your totals here so this would all be filled out at the end by the chief judge and depending on what your total is out of a thousand um, you know 950 and above is a gold 900 to 949 is silver 850 to 899 a bronze so and then 
chief judge would sign off on that after going through all of this with the owner of the car. If there's anything within here that the owner is like, no, that's wrong, you know, um, that can be discussed before things are finally signed off. Um, but anyway, so yeah, a typical judging team, you'll have uh, four judges, including a chief judge. Uh, one of those will be a scribe too. That's usually how we uh, introduce new people into the judging um, they just go along with the clipboard and all of these sheets and just read things off while the other, the other three judges, you know, inspect those things and report back sort of things. So you can kind of learn by watching and being a part of it. Um, so, and typically a judging for a car should take between 60, 90 minutes, um, sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a bit less, depending on the experience of those involved. Um, so yeah. So just go through, and um, this first section is is a, a running section. So, you know, a concourse car should also be an impeccable running car and, and, and run, you know, among the best of them. So in this section, mechanical and safety, you know, you start up the car and, you know, are the gauges responding properly? Is there any visible exhaust leaks? Are there any oil leaks, uh, you know, the signals, etc., the horns, headlights, all of that kind of stuff. Are the doors opening and closing and latching properly? You know, you go through all of that part just in this first section. You'll notice there's correctness and condition. However, in this section, it's only condition because it's all running characteristics. So, but as you continue on through the different areas like engine, engine bay, then you start really getting into correctness and condition because correctness being is, is it the right part? Is it a proper original part? You know, concourse uh, people are more apt to restore an original than buy new. That's, that's the whole point um, uh, in a lot of cases. So it's for those who are really savvy in restoring original pieces uh, to get the, the, the originality and the details right, rather than just replacing things with all these repro parts. So these are the kind of things that separate a concourse car from uh, a, a general running car. Anyway, I'll take you through these sheets a little further. Here are the point, potential points. Um, so when you're looking at, you know, correctness out of three and condition out of one. So you do your deductions. So here you can see uh, water pump, pulley, fan belt, and fan out of three. So I don't have an original water pump. Mine's a replacement, so I'm, I'm going to lose a point there. Um, everything else in there is correct or as original and in beautiful condition. Um, so that should be just the one point loss. Uh, what is this one? Uh, distributor HT leads and O-rings. Okay, I'm going to lose 0.5 because one of my ori like correct original rubber boots has a significant crack in it. Um, so unless I can replace that, I'm going to lose half a point at least for that. Um, but I mean, it's only out of three for condition there. So here, you know, frame, floors, and sills, um, I'm probably going to lose about three points there because of the condition of my frame. Um, as you'll see, it's quite dented. Although it is my original frame and it's correct, you know, it, I shouldn't lose any points for that. Uh, nothing is different or um, it's just dented. So... Um, We'll see. We'll see how much I lose there. But uh, exhaust and hangers, yeah, I've got, uh, I, you know, I've lengthened my exhaust. I, I've made it correct in every way. It's the, the right color and everything like that. Now, it's not an original Burgess exhaust, so I'll lose a point there. Um, because, you know, some people do find this stuff new hold stock, so they can get full recognition for that if they have that, you know. But I'll lose a point there. I might actually lose two points because the the downpipe is a slightly different curve than original so yeah i'll probably lose two points there actually um but it is what it is um so you can see how you go through this stuff um as it stands i came out a high silver but um i'm gonna try and claw a lot of these points back over this winter so based on where i'm losing points here i've put together a list over here so here is my list of things to do this winter. Uh, it's a long list, as you can see, so I'm not going to read everything off, but uh, so you can take a snapshot if you'd like. And uh, 
we'll proceed with these things as we do them uh, throughout the rest of the video. Let's get into it. And it's Christmas come early. I've just received this package from uh, Rogers Motors. Great uh, website, great source for any Austin Healy lighting. In fact, I should say I I have purchased all of my Austin Healy's lighting from them. They have a great stock of new old stocks. All of these Lucas lamps, the 488 and the Lucas headlamps, I was able to get from them, including my tail lamps as well. So I've uh, been able to get a whole bunch of wonderful, really hard to find new old stock stuff from them. Um, always worth uh, calling them. Um, yeah, Rogers Motors, really great. So here is my new old stock pair of Lucas 700 spot lamps. So really nice. And they've got the, you know, the bracket that mounts inside of the uh, bulb housing. Um, I should mention that initially I thought they, I bought it from their website and I thought it was a, a new old stock pair that I bought and this bracket on new ones is mounted to the outside. So you see a, a, an edge around the outside, whereas original old ones, it's mounted on the inside with the rivets. So I realized that studying the concourse guidelines. So I sent it back and got their best pair of new old stock um, old ones, which are look just as nice, just beautiful. Really glad to have those. So even came with an extra bulb in its original BMC box. Um, and then what else, th what other goodies? I finally, after years of looking, found an original new old stock Lucas single bulb license plate lamp. And you can see there's a brand new bulb in there <laughs> ready to go. Um, all the new ones of these have twin bulb um, and originals only had the single bulb and so really glad to have found an original spec one to get that point <laughs> right in my concourse judging. Um, now for turning on my uh, spot lamps I've got a period correct Lucas little switch plate with an LR switch, the standard pull switch, same as the headlight switch, LR standing for long range for these spot lamps. And there's a little warning light for when they're on so you don't leave them on. And this little switch guy is gonna mount beautifully just on the passenger side underneath of the parcel tray there. I'll just show you here. So what I'm thinking is I'm probably gonna mount it here if it'll fit. Well, either here or under the dash, although I was sitting in there and I think under the dash it's going to get in the way with my knees so I think we'll probably put it under the parcel tray instead. So really glad to have that and last but not least after again years of searching I found a set of original pointed fuses in 35 and 50 amp. Really great to have a nice full set to go with my original fuse block. So lots of goodies. Like I say, I've already got all the wiring and stuff ready to go to install these spot lamps. So can go about getting that all assembled. Thanks again, uh, Jeff at Jolly Rogers Motors. You really helped me out here. Great guys, look, look them up, Rogers Motors. So here you can see the difference, the uh, rear license plate lamp. This is the new one that I had. I've just taken one of the bulbs out of it, but it was a bulb on either side. I use those little LED bulbs. But you can see how much bigger that is just all around um, than an original here. I've just transferred over the LED bulb there, but it's just a single bulb. Um, much different seal um, than this thing had. Just massive, that thing. So yeah, the wires will be coming in over there. So I gotta open up that hole still. Um, and even in the glass, uh, the newer glass had cracked. Um, there's a little rubber seal on the original one for the, for the bolt uh, that holds it all together. So um, new one doesn't have that. Yeah, lots of little differences. Anyway, we'll get that all reinstalled and good to go. So there is, I mean, it's hard to tell, but there is my replacement uh, license plate light. That's a proper new old stock original one with the single bulb. So I got it nicely wired in there. You got the heat shrink on that bit of wire that comes from the boot. 
Um, and yeah, you can get under and have a look, but you can definitely see it's just the single bulb on the one side and it's got the smaller gasket on it. Tricky to tell under here, but uh, yeah, it's all done. Okay, and look at that. We've got the fog lights now installed. Sorry, spot lamps now installed on, on my badge bar that I've put in there. And uh, so wiring-wise, I'll show you a little clip of my wiring diagram. So here's my little wiring diagram. You can take a snapshot or freeze frame of this if you want. But here I'm using, uh, there's my spot lamps, each grounding wiring coming down. This is the S or DB40 uh, Lucas Relay. These relay switches are common for horns and overdrive and all of that. Um, <clears throat> and you can see it grounds there. I've got power coming from, I've tied into the white, like the ignition circuit. So when you turn the key, you get power. Um, I've got 10 amp fuse in, uh, inline fuse there just to protect it. And then my other power feed comes in th uh, through the switch that I've, I've got one of the, that Lucas switch with the warning light. Um, and that one's coming in off of the red lighting circuit. So when the, the headlights have to be on basically um, for this, for the spot lamps to be able to turn on. So yeah, so there it is, pretty simple. I'll show you how I wrote it in the car. You know, basically each lamp grounds, uh, there's a ground inside of it, so it grounds to the body. Um, and then you've got your power lines coming out here, which I've got a wire uh, hidden under the bumper here with connectors on either end for it to plug into. And then here it's a double connector and I've got the main feed coming from under the overrider there, wrapping around my bumper bracket. I've added a wire clip here, just utilizing one of those uh, existing, you can see those are for uh, like towing eyes, I guess, if you wanted to have them, um, but they just go all the way through. It's the same holes that the bumper brackets use just on the other side, but they're threaded. So uh, yeah, I was able to put a wiring clip there just to keep it up, and then it goes up and over the frame member there, comes back down and it ties into the rest of my main wiring harness there along the frame and then it ducks up the uh, firewall so looks really nice and of course i've done the uh, um, heat shrink tubing on these just to protect them from the elements and uh, yeah and of course that wire as you can see i wrapped it in electrical tape like they would do at the factory, like the main harness is like that, just to protect it from the elements. And uh, yeah, and it comes back and comes up, uh, comes up with the rest of these wires up the side there. There's some clips that it goes through. Um, I was able to tap into the white uh, and red here for utilizing power, uh, just using the joiner clips, okay? And then it comes up on the inside of the car here you can see right there I, the uh, leftmost wire coming up from there is the wiring for the lights it all just utilizes that clip on this side goes up and behind the heater and then you can see there's my switch in that over on the other side and here we are on the other side um, and there's the wires coming through for the relay up on top you can see it just grounds to the firewall there and then I've got another wrapped pair of wires coming down to the switch and light. So yeah, I'm very happy with that and it all works great. So if I decide down the road, I don't like it, I can easily take it all out. Yeah, to turn them on, of course I do um, ignition, turn the lights on and then I turn it on here and it has its own little warning lamp, which is pretty cool. And, uh, and there we go, we have light. So that, of course, the one thing I'm not happy with is the multi-tones here. So obviously the, the uh, headlamps and the uh, spot lamps are using the modern LED bulbs, which cast a really white light. And I've got just standard incandescent bulbs on my signal lamps there. Um, as well as my tail lights. Basically, the reason that is is because 
um, I want to re you know continue using my original flasher. But uh, I may actually just swap out these bulbs, the LED bulbs, for some standard incandescents, at least for the show. So everything matches and everything is as original. So we'll get it judged that way. And then, yeah, after judging, maybe in the future, I'll swap out for the LEDs again everywhere and just have the modern flasher in there. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I might be able to somehow rebuild the original one with the modern one components inside of the original shell but uh okay look at that we've got the standard incandescent light bulbs in everything now so it all matches that looks much better and and original so wow does that ever look nice and uh when i turn out the light here yeah you can really see nice and bright and cast a nice light so i've been able to do all my aiming there i've adjusted both the spot lamps and the headlamps so yeah looking really good so that looks fantastic here's the tail lights and that's that single bulb license plate light in there now still nice and bright does the trick and here's my dash lights you can see the the spot lamp warning light there on the right so that's great. Okay, and I've just taken the top and top frame out of the car. So you can see I, uh, I just undid the screws and nuts there. Of course, I had this all well covered, so it's protected. Um, so now I can, with the top and frame out of here, I can take out this rear cockpit rail and... Uh, get into redoing this so here you can see i've got the door shut face panels nicely removed i've taken the piping off i'll be reusing that um, and here's the new uh, kill martin ones so they have no holes whatsoever drawn um, so i've traced on in the pen line not the marker line uh, what this has to be and made the where the hole's going to be um, that was easy enough to figure out using the back plates, which have a partial hole around, so you just flip it. Um, and I did double check, it works both ways with the latch. So yeah, that, that allows you to make the perfect circle hole there, what it needs to be. So, um, and as you can see, before I removed these from the car, I taped around the latch, so I got the location exactly right. Um, so I just have to transfer that over now. So that's what I'm doing, and then, uh, so next step will be to carefully cut these out nice and neat and, you know, dress the edge and make it nice and clean, um, and then drill out these holes. Uh, this plastic, as you can see, is starting to lift here, so that's not super reliable, so I'm going to have to um, uh, just pull the plastic off and re I just used uh, green tape all over it and redo this marking before I cut it. Okay, so here we go. I've got all the holes drilled now. Um, this one, I drilled a bunch, a series, same drill bit as I used for these. I just drilled a whole bunch of holes around and then cleaned it out with a mill file, a, a half round mill file that was just the right size. So I was able to just draw the line and come out to the line. Um, and yeah, and then I've, I've pre-drilled the screw holes where they are with the, in line with the last one. So nice, these ones already come with this little cut here, which the uh, other ones that I had didn't. I had to make that cut. And it's actually a factory thing and they tap it over um, at the top there. So ready to go now. So I'm, I'm gonna peel the tape off and glue the piping on and then we'll put it back in place. Okay, and here we are, all reinstalled. You can see no more hole in behind, and that looks beautiful. I got the piping nicely reinstalled, got it all screwed back in place. So I gotta give it a polish. There's some fingerprints visible there, but uh, yeah, it's looking much better. Um, so that looks really good. Very happy to have that done. And I've got the other side done too, so see that? 
nicely clears. That looks great. Nice alignment, beautiful. And over on the other side, you've got this one all done too. So that's looking fantastic. Very glad to have that fixed. And as you can see, I got the cockpit rail reinstalled. And um, yeah, while it was off, the other thing I did here, which you probably never notice, I replaced this right rear fender beating entirely. Um, my old one before, I had it mislocated here and had a terrible looking edge there. So, um, and also on the rear here, there was a flat spot here where I had gotten a little too aggressive with my mallet and uh, created a flat spot. So glad to have fixed that. I got a new beading in and just started over, pulled the old one out carefully, made sure to tape everything and, and reinstalled a new one and got that lined up exactly where it needs to be. It should come up just to the fin uh, cockpit rail as it does there. It doesn't go under and it has that nice finished edge there. So glad to have that sorted. And now everything's back together. Cockpit rail, rail is reinstalled and yeah, this looks fantastic. And just arrived today, a few more pieces that I've been able to gather. Uh, we've got original restored um, oil uh, oil flex line for your oil pressure gauge. Uh, we've got an original restored uh, tight flex line. That's the fuel flex line that goes up to the carburetor lead. Um, that's great to have. That's what my original one was, and I tried to reuse mine, and it was leaking around the fittings, um, which he instructed me I might actually be able to fix that. So I'm gonna dig my old one out and see if I can fix it for the future. Um, yeah, and this is, uh, he, I guess, replaces this line, but keeps the ends and just reattaches the ends, so you keep everything. And of course, the tag, he takes it off the old one and puts it on, so it's a nice, good as new line um, in the original style. Um, these are the 7 8 clamps that are going to go onto my breather hose. Again, I was a little not sure if the earlier cars had it, but I'm going to put them on just in case so I don't lose any points potentially, depending on who's judging. Um, these are the taller turn snaps that I'm going to have in these corners, like I was mentioning before, so glad to have those finally. Those took forever to come across, so... Yeah, thanks again, Roger, and uh, we'll get those put on. And in here, I will point out, I've done a few little additions. I've got my new old stock oil line there, and that looks much better. You can see that, just beautiful. And I've started the car and it runs beautifully, no leaks. And um, there is my, the 7 8 uh, clamps I've installed on that breather hose line. Um, also, as you can see, I've now removed my fan mechanism that I had blowing on the carburetor float poles. That's all taken out and good as new. And, um, and then here is my pointed fuses all mounted in the fuse block to make that look totally correct. So full points there. So we're coming along really nicely. It's looking much better in here. Um, basically, all I got to do is change out the ignition, like I was mentioning, and we're good to go. And here we are with the uh, new old stock tight flex fuel line installed. So that looks great. And I uh, already turned the ignition on to power up the fuel pump and no leaks. So always got to check that. And uh, yeah, so that's much better. And here you can see... Uh, my wiring again, just uh, going along the underside. This is my new lead going up to the uh, spot lamps that I've just wrapped the same way as the main harness was and tied it into the same clips going along there. And then it ducks up the top there, up the firewall. So yeah, this is looking great. Uh, mind the dents under here. Um, this is my original frame, but uh, really solid otherwise. But uh, yeah, there are dents from its lifetime. Um, so I will definitely lose some points for that. Um, not sure how many, but 
definitely some, but at least it's the original frame. It's not different. It's not, you know, one of those jewel frames or something like that that's totally out of place. Um, so I should be okay that way, that way. So yeah. Okay, so now we've got the car jacked up nice and high so I can do uh, all of the underside uh, related things. So I'm gonna be starting off by giving it a thorough wash and uh, scrubbing all the undersides and nooks and crannies and getting it as clean as I can. Um, I can do any, uh, uh, addressing any leaks or drips that I've got going on. I've already addressed a few under here, uh, mostly in the gearbox area. Um, I've always had the, the standard leak at the rear main seal, so it always drips right there where that little cotter pin is. There's my finger here, right there. That is like a, a oil comes out of the rear scroll seal into the bell housing there and that hole is there so that it can drain and that's what that cotter pin is actually for so that the drain hole doesn't get plugged and it always has a spot to drip <laughs> it's just the design of these early cars that's how they were done um so you know it is what it is it will always have a, a slight drip there um but um it's much better now than it ever was uh, since I put that PCV valve in uh, through Mike Salter. It's uh, cut it in, uh, in half about the, the leak that I had. Um, anyway, so I will be giving it a full oil change too and, and uh, replacing the drain plug with a magnetic drain plug. Um, original floors with the 100 pressing in them, you can see. So I will be removing the tailpipe uh, to add that two inches in it. So I'll be undoing it right here and uh, removing it. And I'm gonna put the two inches in, um, probably right somewhere in here so that that bend that to go up is directly under the body seam here as it should be, so. Okay, so I've just removed my tailpipe and made a line that's where i'm going to add the two inch piece so we'll get them to cut it and splice that in there and then we'll have to dress the welds to blend them in and then i'll repaint the area repaint the whole thing and make it disappear so that should be exactly what we want and i've extended my exhaust so you can't even tell that they put in a two inch section right there and extended it that two inches so it just clears the overrider now and that uh, bend happens right under the body seam there as it should so really glad to have done that but before it was stopping like right here and it was just my overrider was just black after you know every drive so this should help a lot i'm hoping and uh and yeah the other thing was that bend was under there and now it's out level with it as it should be and it mentions that in the guidelines so glad to have that sorted um and yeah that looks beautiful i just repainted it in the black uh i use like barbecue paint because it's good for high heat and you know blends really well and really quick and easy this is a stainless exhaust so it should last a good long time and uh yeah that barbecue paint sticks like glue to it so it works really well so that about finishes my underside issues. So I've, I've given it a proper washing. It's all nice and clean in here. I just wanted to give a quick shot in here to show how nice and tidy this is. I've got my original bump stop boxes there with the original rubbers. So this is the early BN1 style. Can't buy those rubbers new. They only sell the later style, which was like a little tower here. Um, or it's a totally different shape than the original ones, what's available now. But I've got, you know, there's my Lucas batteries there, the little Lucas caps going along the top in black there, the original, the proper uh, helmet style battery connectors. That's all correct there. This is the, the ground strap coming down to the frame here. It's my original shocks, all the proper hardware, original British fasteners there. There's my fuel pump. I've got a proper tag on there now, part number tag, uh, and the proper tape wrapping on it. So, um, yeah, should do okay in here. Um, yeah.
So, oh, and here's, that shows the uh, factory undercoating that was just brush painted on. It was just this lower area in here and up in here, just around the axle here. The rest of the car was not undercoated on these, but um, yeah, so that's all done properly. So full points there. And of course my leaf springs that I, I took in and modified to have the proper uh, style clamps, early style clamps put on, um, the proper number of leaves and that. So those are all looking good. And, uh, and it has a good, a correct ride height, which is really nice. We'll see how long that lasts because typically these repro springs don't last more than about 10 years and then you get sag. So yeah. Anyway, so we should be looking pretty good in here. So I can put the wheels back on. And this is all nice and clean. You can see I've got the proper hardware here now for my top frame. I changed that out uh, just the other day. So lots of improvements. So really happy about all that. Uh, yeah, there's my leaf springs, which I had custom customized to make them more like the earlier style of with the early style clips on them and the right amount of clips on them. So all these little things that'll help uh, get us full points, hopefully. So you can see here, just even the fender mounting, this is something a lot of people get wrong, that it's got the, the screws with nuts on the backside and they're the proper uh, 5 uh, uh head uh, British nuts. And then there's this truss screw. This is one that most people miss but we, the going theory is that uh, when they were building up the bodies at Jensen, they would put this screw in first. It was a self-tapping truss screw. They just send it up into the sill just to locate the dog leg here. And then they would drill and install these screws with nuts. Um, and this be going right into the sill was obviously a really heavy source of rust and would also, often decay. So that's why a lot of people don't have it because they never knew it was there. But these all had it. So little things like that. Again, the little V cut out in the bottoms of the front fenders there. Um, uh, you know, people who get replacement fenders in that, uh, that's usually filled in and not there. So I've got the proper British head bolts there and the little V cut out, which is on both sides. What that cutout's for is it's right in line with the pedal um, pivot, which is like a rod that goes through there. Um, and to get it, you know, to line up, you've got to have a little notch cut out there so you can send it straight in. So they did it on both sides, depending on what uh, hand drive it was. So all these little details. Of course, my front suspension has all the correct British hardware uh, in the black phosphate finish. Um, it's got, you know, these are oriented the way they should. They're mostly all with the screw on the front and nuts on the back, except for the end two are swip swatched around. It is the proper small British nuts that have like a 5 16 head. Um, you know, it's all the right fasteners. You can look in here. It's got the, the brass uh, nuts here for the headlights. It's got the red plastic caps on those adjustment screws. The wiring is exactly as it should be. You've got the big uh, uh, O-ring there to hold the, uh, hold the wiring to the light there. Um, and then of course the yellow zinc clips and this one goes up and they are wrapped around each other like that just as original so that's all correct that's my correct original early steering column it just has a flat top later ones had you know a bunch of business on the top there um, these are all the correct nuts as they should be these special tight nuts it's got the correct boots and the correct early style um, steering arms with, that are adjustable there. So all these little details that help make it all. Oh, these are those nuts I was talking about earlier that the four sway bar nuts that are those tall aero tight nuts. So they stay tight, they don't come off. Um, yeah, so all the correct stuff, there's my Nicely restored horns in the proper color with the tags and the proper uh, uh, hardware, mounting hardware. So yeah, this is an early enough BN1 that it doesn't have a partition in the middle here. Normally you can't sight across there, but early cars you can. So that's all correct. Um, yeah, so this is all looking really good. So should get full points on that. Uh, last year I replaced that nut with the proper 
castle nut. It was one of those um, uh, modern nuts on there before. So yeah, I have gone through and improved all of this stuff. So it's all looking really good. Okay, so I've just installed a an underseat armacord snap where it should go uh, just in the center on the inside of the center section. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a proper brass snap. Another thing a lot of people get wrong on these, but they were originally brass. Same thing with the uh, carpet snaps. The uh, female part that joins them should be brass, not uh, nickel silver. And there it is with the mat installed. You can just see that single snap there on the inside center of that mat. And I've got everything reinstalled, including my over mats. That's those bound over mats. The, the, mat, the, the original factory mat that's underneath is not bound, as we know. So, um, but yeah, nice to have that all vacuumed and cleaned and looking beautiful. So now I can just do the same to the other side. And freshly back from Victoria Plating, we've got our freshly chromed original knockoffs. And those came out beautifully. I was concerned I was going to lose some of the lettering because it was already so shallow. But uh, nope, they came out really nicely. So it's, it's almost on the verge of losing it on some of the letters. But you can still see every letter completely. So I'm quite happy with that. I suppose if one wanted to, they could get it them pre-engraved before going for chroming but uh that's getting crazy with cost chroming's already really expensive and engraving is pretty insane now too so yeah glad to have those back so i'll be greasing them up with the uh, i like to use the silver uh anti-seize stuff um instead of grease it has a grease in it you can see it on my splines here and it does a really good job of keeping them well greased and if any does come out uh, it's silver and it doesn't show <laughs> as badly as dark grease would. So I'll just show you the difference. This is my original one that I've just had uh, re-chromed and you can compare it to the new one that's on there. Um, original one below, brand new ones on above. You can see the whole, the whole shape is a little different. Um, just slightly, but uh, the location of the letters is slightly different. And when you look down, see how the originals were evenly thick all the way to the end, whereas these repros taper. They're quite sharp and pointy in comparison. So that's the major difference. Yeah, so nice to have these originals turning out so well. You can see like those letters are nice, nice and crisp. So I'm very happy with that. Good find. Of course, another thing I should mention with original knockoffs is that they were steel, um, not brass like the new ones are. So you can always just check that with a magnet. Um, you can check a number of things with a magnet when you're doing your judging, like fenders and bonnets and boot lids and things like that, that on earlier cars, bonnet and boot lid would be aluminum. Whereas uh, later cars, it was steel, so you can check that kind of stuff. Okay, so tops up, I've adjusted the seal a bit, so it's sealing much nicely, much nicer along the windshield there. Um, I just had to taper it off a little bit on either end so that it could come down a little tighter. And of course, when I reinstalled the top frame in the car, I was able to adjust its angle slightly too, so that it's uh, making better contact with the windscreen. Uh, so that's much better. And now I've got, I've done some additional modification to, not modification, just improvements to my top latches. I replaced these hook parts with, I've got the proper uh, patent uh, stamped one. And uh, and now I've got uh, correct hardware here. I had the right screws before, but uh, um, I've now got the proper dome nuts, as you can see on the inside there, which I didn't have before. So that's all now totally correct, full points. So it's got the correct little uh, rounded tape, uh, skinny rounded nuts on the outside here, correct for this style of top latch. They varied over the years. Um, 
and now I've got the right hooks and the right hardware. So that's all now corrected. Um, down here, I have replaced these turn snaps. I had some of the, they were the proper early British round ones like you get. Modern ones are all squared off. So, um, but these came in two different sizes. Uh, there were short ones and taller ones. And I had the short ones in, which is not correct. So I've now got, I've found a set of taller ones. And I'll tell you, I finished this restoration like two and a half years ago. I have been looking for these taller snaps since the beginning of the restoration for like the last seven years then, uh, and finally just found a pair. So they're not easy to come by, but now we've got that fixed, so full points there. And of course, um, I've also got all, all the correct snaps. Um, I mean, I was always able to, I found these over a number of years. So uh, those are not easy to find, these being the knurled head, you can see that etching there. So to find a full set of these for a BN1 is not easy. There's, a, there's I believe, 15 of them, if you include the, the ones used on the top, tonneau cover, armrest, and side screens all get those. So full set of those. So that's great. Just getting all these details checked off and it's taken a long time to find it. So I'm very grateful to everyone who's been able to help out uh, you know who you are so thank you very much guys um, great to have this kind of stuff okay and i've now uh installed my original uh champion na8 spark plugs i was able to get a full set remarkably um, they are not easy to find um, and then this is my original distributor cap original coil and the wire's done properly with the numbered boots. You can see they have a, uh, let's just zoom in here. You can see the three on there. So they're all just molded numbered boots. So this is all now completely accurate engine bay. You've got the wrapped hoses everywhere, rad hoses, even the heater hoses had that textured finish on them. The uh, air, uh, uh, crankcase breather hose there those are all correct this i've done to look like the original um fabric covered air hose there i've got the proper uh, oil flex line there now um pointed fuses you know everything's as it should be you know you got the all the correct fasteners through here with the uh the um plated wiring clips for routing this. It's got the, the single slot head screw that was unpainted just in this location um, as original. Yeah, so this is all looking, you know, proper hose clamps, original rad cap, all these hard to find details um, we've got corrected. So should do very well for the engine bay. Really happy to have that all sorted out now. Looks beautiful. Okay, and I've just taken it out for a test drive uh, on the highway, back and forth. Overdrive was working beautifully in and out, and so that's great. And another thing I'll mention, uh, this test drive, I was out on the highway, like I say, and uh, the top, it used to have quite a gap in the middle, and especially when you got on the highway and get wind under it, it would make that gap quite noticeable. You could see it light through from the inside, just in the middle there a bit. Um, but my adjustments with the top frame and those new hooks and that and, and uh, adjusting the seal itself a little bit, just thinning it a little bit on the edges so it can come down more, um, seems to have fixed it. It didn't lift up at all on the highway and uh, it's nice, no daylight visible through and it seems nice and tight against the top of that windscreen. So that's really good. That's the best fit I have seen yet on one of these. Uh, these hundreds can be really finicky to get a seal there so i'm not going to assume that it's going to protect me from driving rain but uh <laughs> it's better than it ever was and uh i'm i'm quite happy about that so on to the next things on the list we're getting getting working our way through towards the end of this list so that's really good um oh another thing i did this morning um, obviously the car's back on its wheels. I took all the wheels, uh, threw them in the back of my truck and took them to a car wash, like a do-it-yourself car wash. 
and properly cleaned them with a pressure washer and suds and a, a scrub brush and just got in between all the spokes and gave them a really good cleaning uh, front and back and then uh, you know, dried them all off and fresh grease in the hubs and, and polished the tires and so they're looking really good now um, to go with those nice uh, um, original knockoffs that I've got re -chromed. So yeah, we're earning some points back at least. So won't get full points, but uh, we'll do, we're at least better than we were for those wheels. So that's great. So just putting everything back in the car, um, you know, I've redone my seat cushions and that. They've got better foam in there now. And I've uh, tacked on, as original, only on early BN1s. Uh, we found conclusive evidence that they're, they did this white linen, um, just neatly tacked around the edges. Obviously folded back on itself. Um, and it's, like I say, only early BN1s. They stopped doing this sort of in the summer of 54. Um, uh, it seems to be the end of it. And interestingly, the cars that I found that had this linen on it, um, often in tatters by the time I find it, but uh, some are better than others, but um, often the case when I find that it had linen, uh, the wood underneath was not painted black. It was just left bare wood because they were going to be finishing it with this linen. Um, so interesting details on the evolution of these seat cushions. So once they got rid of the linen, then they started treating the wood because it was going to be exposed. So put this back in here. And always got to make sure get the back going in, it goes underneath these little tabs here. And you got to make sure that the front drops down into the tray and it's not sitting up on it. I have caught so many people with their seat cushion sitting up on the tray and they're saying, ah, it's out of alignment, it doesn't look right. Well, it's not put in right, so yeah, it should look like that when you put, put it in. So that's good to go. Looking really good. And you know, I've, I, I'm glad I redid these. I had some pretty bad wrinkles in the back here from... You know, I had done these originally years ago, so um, they're much better improved now. Um, the pleats, I'm, I used actual cotton batting within the pleats, um, so it gives it a natural feel. And of course, this is authentic Connolly leather that I purchased from Connolly's, and it got a certificate of authenticity, so it should go a long way. Now, one more thing on my list is alignment and recentering the steering wheel. So you can see I, I was out for a drive the other day and when I came in back into the shop here, I made sure to kind of back up and drive the car in straight, as straight as possible. And um, so I came in, I know that my wheels are straight. So I've uh, made some marks using a, a um, an L, square against the wheel and just check the wheel al alignment to make sure that the toe in um, is correct so it, they should be a little bit pointed in towards the center sort of thing at the front they should be like this um, by only like an eighth of an inch so i was able to measure that and make sure that they are still lined up and they are so the backs kick out an eighth of an inch more than the fronts do which is good. Um, and you can see the uh, camber. There's not much you can do that about that on hundreds that have original frames. I know the new frames where the shock mounts on the tower, there's an adjustment there. Um, but this being an original frame, I don't have that adjustment. So they, they were always like this, um, which isn't terrible, but it's noticeable. You can see the, the angle of the wheel there. Um, Anyway, um, so that is what it is. Um, so I've got the wheels straight and I know that they're in alignment. So now you can see my steering wheel is not perfectly straight. It's always been off to the side a little bit and that should be straight up and down. So that's just um, because I had installed it and then I did some alignment adjustment at the front and that threw it off. So now I got to take the steering wheel off again, which is quite an ordeal because I've got to you know, at the front, I got to undo the nut on the end of the steering column and undo the wires for the horn and, you know, and then 
pull this entire thing out with the stator tube and everything like that and then I can get at the nut underneath of it and pull the steering wheel off and realign it and put it back. So that is my next step here. So I'm going to mark the uh, steering column so that I keep this alignment. I, I'm going to hopefully do all of this without moving the wheels at all but I'm going to make marks just in case so that I can keep things go back to this alignment and uh, yeah we'll take it all apart. I'm going to have to take the top down so I can get the stator tube all the way out. And uh, yeah, we'll be, when I take the steering wheel off, I've got a couple of little chips uh, around the edges here where this paint, this is just rattle can paint when I restored this. So I'm going to take that off. I'm going to strip the paint, at least on the hub, um, and uh, repaint it with a proper urethane type of paint so it'll be much stronger and then put it all back together. So that's the next step. Down at the front here, I have, with keeping the wheels straight, um, I was able to get underneath the car and reach up there. But um, you can see there's the end of the steering column right there. Um, so I've taken the nut off the end there and you can see the little uh, olive gland that I've got to break free from that. Um, but once I do, you know, grease, a little bit of grease might come out here. I'm probably going to put a rag there. Um, it's easy to wipe off anyway. Um, but anyway, the wire for the horn comes out of the stator tube. It comes through that upper tray there and came down here. And you can see where I've taken the wiring clip out here and disconnected the horn here. So yeah, now that's just the, the end of the uh, wire. I've fed it through the hole there so it's up <laughs> behind the grill here if you can see let me hang on <laughs> yeah you can see it all there so um let me get my camera in here yeah you can see the uh the horn cable coming up through there so it's got plenty of slack i've just got to break that olive free which i might be able to do just by pushing the horn in a little bit um, but anyway that's the end of the stator tube we're going to shove it all the way through with it Okay, so this should be loose now. There we go. Yeah, there she goes. We can pull this out. So, got it out this far, and you can see my steering hub has all those chips in it. And it's a lot more than <laughs> I thought. And I don't think I can live with it, so... Yeah, I was just going to do a quick touch up, but I think I'm going to have to take this steering wheel right off, which means taking this stator tube all the way out. Um, and to do that properly, I've got to disconnect the horn mechanism from the stator tube. And you'll see there's these three screws back here, little flat heads. You got to be really careful to not strip them. And uh, yeah, carefully take those three guys out and then I can pull the stator t uh, or the uh, horn with its wire out of the stator tube. So I'll push the stator tube sort of back in. And then on the other end here, you can see here's the wire. I pulled it up through that uh, front panel there. And the wires, the way they come out, the, the bullets are staggered so that you can pull it through that skinny little stator tube. So I've taped them up so they're not splayed out. It'll help it go through there a little easier. Um, this is the nut and olive that we pulled off of the wire there. So, yeah, you can see my, that's just the tip of my stator tube there. So I'm going to uh, feed the wire through the stator tube all the way up through the column. And then, then I'll pull the stator tube out. Okay, and there we've got the steering wheel and horn mechanism removed from the car. I've just set it here carefully on my bench. Um, I wasn't able to get the wires all the way through. It started bunching up there, so, but it, I got them nice and straight and I was able to pull it out that way carefully. Um, so I've got this thing marked. You gotta be really careful that this doesn't fall off or get bent or, you know, these are so delicate. So um, yeah, I've got all my pieces there. Here's the wire, and here's my horn mechanism, carefully in some rags there. So, safe and sound um, for the time being. So, 
what I'm going to do now is take my steering wheel and strip this. Um, and uh, of course, I'm going to mask off the chrome or the polished spokes, um, not chrome, but um, mask those off. Strip this thing down, and then I'm going to give it to uh, a shop to do a proper urethane spray in a, in a gloss black, so it'll be nice and durable. Um, it won't chip away. You can see I got a chip right there right in the outside body that was always there. I didn't even notice it, but uh, yeah, this rattle can stuff just doesn't stand the test. So no problem. We've evolved as I've evolved in my restoration methods, um, but uh, you know, uh, not bad for my first uh, home restoration. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna improve on a few of these things that have started to show their wear. Um, and yeah, we'll be much better for it and be able to recenter the, the wheels, which are still centered, so I cannot move the car <laughs> while I'm restoring the steering wheel, because um, it's nice and centered and hasn't moved. So that's good. Okay, and I've just uh, got my steering wheel back from the paint shop. Um, I brought it up to uh, Sydney and gave it to Jetstream, so Sean, uh, who painted my car initially um, he redid my steering wheel for me so thanks a lot Sean the guys at Jetstream another beautiful job so that's a nice proper urethane uh, professional finish on there it's not going anywhere um, so yeah and he even added a little bit of flattener because he knows I don't like it over the top shiny because they never were um, so yeah it's just a nice gloss can't see your reflection in it, but it's shiny. So that's great. Very happy with that. So I've just pushed it on there temporarily. Uh, I'm gonna play with it and make sure that I get it perfectly straight up and down. Um, might be, it's pretty close, but it needs to, it's a little bit to the right right now. So I'm gonna maybe move it one cog over. You just gotta push it on, pull it out, and you know, on that spline there, so. We'll get that sorted out and then uh, replace the nut. Okay, so I've got the steering wheel nicely centered. Um, like I say, I was able to do this entire thing without moving those front wheels at all. And this has been driven in and out, back and forth until I got really straight. Um, so yeah, this is nicely centered on there and I've put on the uh, indicator stop, which is, it's got that special washer, it's serrated washer in there and then ran the nut on and I've gotten that as tight as I can. Um, so that's good and this all moves together um, and yeah. So that's great, I'm, uh, it's all installed. So now I can reinstall the stator tube. So. I've got the stator tube ready here. I've been able to uh, push those wires down. That's just the end of the one. They're still taped in there. I was able to get it squeezed past that uh, choke point there. So the wires are all nicely in there. Here it is coming out here. And so I'm gonna carefully with the trafficator in one hand and the stator tube in the other hand, I'm gonna carefully walk it over here and feed the stator tube down in and uh, until it comes through the other side. Okay, and now, so it's pushed in as far as here. So now with it stuck out like this, I've now got to screw the trafficator, uh, the trafficator to the stator tube here with screws that come in from behind. Remember those three little tiny slot head? I think they're like 2BA or something like that um, screws. So fine thread. So yeah, I'll be screwing that on. We've got our wavy washer here. We gotta make sure that that goes into place um, as we offer it up. And of course, this is what will engage with the little tang there. So I'll get that screwed in place and then we'll push it the rest of the way home and then address the wires on the other side here where it's coming through to the steering column. Okay, and look at that. I've got it all fully reinstalled and nicely centered. And uh, yeah, and, and the trafficator, uh, the um, canceling mechanism is properly located. I've got it on the bottom and it's properly 
centered on that so it cancels properly now um it was canceling and then and then it stopped canceling one day and it's because that canceling ring inside had come loose because the nut holding the steering wheel on it was slightly loose so it's, if it's loose enough for that thing to spin then you lose your canceling oh. so now that's uh retightened much tighter than it was and uh nicely centered and a nice professional beautiful paint job on there nice so I'll show you just down at the front here again. I mean, I showed you when I took it apart, but there it is. If I put the olive back on with the nut, so the olive's just underneath the nut there, but that tightens down and seals the end of the steering column there where the stator tube comes out. And then of course the wire comes out and goes down through a little, you can almost see behind the steering column there, there's a little grommet in this tray that uh, it comes through. And then underneath here, where are we here? Yeah, there it is. There's the grommet with the wire coming through and it just routes under and I've put this screw, now I gotta wipe it all off because I got greasy hands, but uh, <laughs> put the screw back on with the uh, wiring clip underneath and done up all the wires. And then I just tuck them under the main harness there so they're not hanging down exposed. Um, so it just keeps them out of the way. And there we go. There's my nicely painted horns there. So good to go. Glad to have that all sorted out. I'm just gonna wipe that down while I'm under here and get it clean. And, uh, and there we are dead straight with the steering wheel. So lovely. Now we can take it out for a drive and see how it is. Well, that was a beautiful drive again. I'm going to call this an end to the video. The car is in tip-top shape, ready to be judged in May. So hope to see you all at Rendezvous. Until next time, I'm Jeff Chrysler, owner of Rightway Heritage Trimming and a detail enthusiast. We'll see you again.